welcome to the News Reviews and Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Sanzo, and joining me today is Silver Quill. I am the ghost of Christmas Blast. Blast? That's right. No holiday is complete without explosions! Oh no. Are you going to be okay? Take that as a no. Yep. <laughs> also joining us today is Terra. So I'm curious though, is so is the go- Ghost of Christmas Blast also Michael Bay? <laughs> I make millions of dollars from my moral bankruptcy. <laughs> so wait, you, you, you're morally bankrupt but you're rich? Congratulations, you've described a vast majority of the 1%. Why is it an oxymoron to itself? No, because <laughs> if you have lots of money and are morally bankrupt, well, give and take I guess. <laughs> but... Anywho, in today's episode, well, this is going to be a special one for you guys because, hey, it's Christmas Eve and, well, okay, Christmas Eve for the Patreons, Christmas for the listeners on the YouTubes and Twitter, sorry, uh, on iTunes and also Stitch Radio. Merry Christmas. And, well, today we're going to do a special one. Uh, we, we don't usually hop on the bandwagon of reviewing things really, really fast, but I think the stars are for this one. Don't you think, Silva? The stars, the dynamite, I'm still rocking the explosion metaphors. <laughs> yes. So, anywho, on this week's episode review, we are going to review the My Little Pony Holiday Special 2019. There's nothing much for me to read on the wiki page because I got no idea how to summarize this one without reading the whole paragraph. But let's just say that Pony Comics, Pony Holidays, much awesomeness. Yays. So, anywho, before we hit right into it, first impressions are in order. Silver. Well, to be honest, I have a, a very jaded experience with holiday comics for My Little Pony. In the past, they've tried to be, they've tried to avoid the saccharine nature that we often get a little tired of with holiday stories. But in doing so, they make everyone really cynical and unpleasant. And I, I've, I've rarely actually been like, yeah, I was could really get behind these stories. So I went into this with more than a little trepidation. But I can say the first comic especially is a lot of fun. It's much more positive. There's still a little bit of uh, unpleasantness, but th- it's kind of the point. It's not taking characters we like and making them unpleasant. It's actually uh, a group that we already know is kind of lousy. <laughs> And even then, there is a beacon of positivity. The second one is an interesting idea and use of characters, but taps a little closer to that uh, cynicism that I that I critique in in past holiday specials. So we shall tackle it as we as we approach. All right, then. And what about you, Tara? I have mixed opinions on it. I was kind of enjoying it, but then later on, it's like, oh, it's one of those things again. And pretty much what Silver said, basically the holiday shtick and whatnot. I'll go into my full opinion later on. <laughs> all right, then, all right, then. And as for me, um, this comic was fun. I, I like. Uh, <laughs> it took me a while before I really read it. Like I, I bought it, and then it took me about a few weeks before I read it. But it was kind of fun. Like, I enjoyed the story. There's two parts to the story, by the way. Uh, the main six and the student six. So, the main six story was quite... Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It was uh, Rarity's uh, National Lampoon. And also, the second part with the student six is... I got no example for it. There has to be an example, right? Not exactly. I mean... We can talk about the mythical figure till the cows come home, because, you know, they fly south for the winter. (laughs) Okay. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a precedent for every story. In fact, I guess you should say, we should say kudos if you came up with something not often touched upon during a holiday special. Mm, True that, true that, true that. But anywho, uh, if you have not read this comic, I highly suggest that you go do, because it's a very enjoyable one. The artwork is done by... And the price and also Pixel Kitties, they're all good, so go check it out. Anyway, um, pause here and go read it first. Welcome back. Uh, so we start off the comic with Applejack with a sprain hoof. It's sprain, right? Well, I mean, I know the term break a leg, but I think she took it too far. <laughs> 
yeah so so let's just say that applejack buck them trees a little bit too hard so the rest of the crew are there comforting her and applejack says oh, you don't need to um what you call this baby over me for a bit because you guys have your own thing to do twilight has a party that she wants to do at the castle and the rest of the friends are going to help and when they reveal the time and date to Rarity, Rarity realizes that she overbooked on the date because she has to go to Manhattan to, well, attend a soiree, a heartwarming soiree in Manhattan with friends and whatnot. So Spike decides to join along for some company and, well, first stop for the party is, well, Rarity and Spike decides to hang out at Twilight's castle party for a bit before they head off to Manhattan via train and they decide to come in fashionably late but it seems that the party isn't ready yet so I'm gonna pause here so guys what do you think first off I think you need to get Pinky away from Applejack (laughs) as uh, she's electrocuting Applejack's injured leg (laughs) while all this is going on so it's like that's like that's not how you treat a friend Pinky yeah, it's decide that is decidedly unfriendly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like um, wrapping the leg with tinsel and uh, lights, and oh goodness me! I mean, I believe that is how you get unfriended very quickly. <laughs> yep. Okay. One, there's so much happening. Andy Price did the artwork for this, and I always love Price for the Easter eggs he throws in. Especially, I'd like to point out in the in the when they first enter the ballroom and everyone's still trying to get things set up. One, Price put in Windy the Windigo in the upper left corner from last year. Uh, was it? yeah, it was last year, and it's somewhat rare for comic artists to reference each other's characters because I believe Tony Fleece did uh, did uh, the Windy the Windigo story last year. Mm-hmm. So it's. Just kind of fun for him to include that. Then, of course, you got to have Kibitz. you got to have Kibitz there. Yeah. It's like one of the best comic comic characters. And so it's just a fun visual to see. And all these ponies moving about. <laughs> Poor Twilight. I don't know if the uh, the chef next to her should really face hoof. That's the future re- ruler of Equestria, pal. You don't want to get on her bad side. Yeah. Oh. she take you down. This is, a, this is just a fun page. This is just fun. Um, Tara, what about you? Well, I mean, at first I kind of like how Pinky, I mean, not to say this in a bad way, but I like how she's kind of torturing Applejack, but in a funny way. <laughs> because, I mean, while they try to be all serious, be like, Rarity, are you doing this and that? And then Applejack's just being in pain with Pinky uh, first pressing down on her, and then she electrocutes her. It's like, wow, just that's just horrible, but you got a good laugh out of it. <laughs> and then when they finally go into the party... They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to be the first to be announced. And then they see everyone getting all mixed up. And I actually kind of find it kind of funny how Twilight's not handling the cheese because, you know, she doesn't like quesadillas because they're so cheesy. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I like how even Rarity's like, oh, yeah, I'll be here to help out. And she's just asking them all these questions and, you know, just trying to help a friend out. Yeah, true that, true that. And, and that one to... that one line that Rarity says, where she tells Pinky, why are you punishing me? That's exactly how I feel with Silver when he throws his great balls at me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, boy. But, hey, anywho, I'm just going to continue on. So, Rarity and Spike are the first to arrive at the party. And when I say first to arrive, just imagine arriving at a party where it's not ready an hour or two hours early. Yeah, they're all sitting up. So, um, Twilight has it's not on her A-game because I think she came back late from Applejack's. So, anywho, um, Rarity helps wherever she can with the carpets, the fondue, the lighting and song. And the first guest to arrive is Princess Celestia and Princess Luna in... What I may say is a pretty interesting outfit. And, oh, Philomena and Tobias. Tobias, was it? Tiberius. Tiberius are there too. Yay. Awesomeness, awesomeness. So, 
Rarity and the princesses are going to have a really awesome conversation before Rarity notices the time and they need to skedaddle. And yeah, let's just say that uh, Rarity and Spike are not going to have a great time there or ain't having a great time there. So they hop on to the train for Manhattan and Rarity just asks Spike how's her dress and whatnot. And Spike just says, oh, you oh, um, you look great as always. And that triggers Rarity to modify her dress because, oh no, this is the same dress I wear every time. Oh no, oh, no, no. So they rush in and whatnot and go into a very snooty party. And yeah, let's just say that this party is not fun. I- I'd rather be on the previous party. The previous party is more fun. Spike saw a candy cane on flank and wants to eat one. And, well, the owner of the dress says, Oh, I don't mind. Um, That's what they're for. And Rarity says, Oh, no, don't do that. Um, That's the design. Oh, no, you're going to ruin it. And the two bond for a bit before Spike pulls Rarity away from the party because, oh, no, she's going to be late for another soiree. So I'm going to pause here. And uh, Tara, what do you think? All right, well, where do I start? There's so much happening. <laughs> well, okay, for the f- first part where um, Luna and Celestia come in, I'm guessing Luna's pet is from the comics, right? Mm-hmm. All right, because when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, I didn't know Luna had a pet. Um, is that a possum? <laughs> yes, it's a possum. Yes. Okay, because I don't know if it was a possum or if it was just a rat or maybe they're both <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> but it's here where it starts, this is where I kind of, didn't start liking it because you've seen this in the show you've seen it in holiday specials where you know you want to make plans for everyone but you got other things to do as well and then you know the one thing too where spike's like you always look great in that outfit it's like always like oh my goodness this is hitting hard for some other people isn't it (laughs) and then of course you know once they entered into the other party where there's that giant sign that says on wednesdays we wear pink and i'm like i wonder what that's a reference to (laughs) there's like so many references and a lot of visual comedies, but the the for me doesn't really help out what's going on with this story wise, and he kind of feels bad for Spike too because he just wants to have fun and eat and whatever. Already, you know, being the fashion freak, she's like, "Don't touch it." <laughs> all right, all right, right. And Silva. Well, let's see here. First off, we should clarify that Skedaddle is not in this comic. He is exclusive to the Key Mark Crusaders episode. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. How to put this? Sometimes the humor can be it could be funny or it could be really cruel case in point while twilight is avoiding the melto 3000 cheese fountain like the plague one i didn't i was like cheese fountain should that be fondue you know chocolate because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i've seen chocolate fountains no a quick google search revealed that yes there are cheese fountains but the chef pony hustling that through is later seen with bandages <laughs> over her right eye Meaning that she was scalded by the melting cheese. And I'd like, well, Merry Christmas. You just horribly scarred someone. I wish she'd be going for that booty. <laughs> you say that as you say that as she's looking at rarity. Yeah. She go looking for that her... rarity booty. Oh my. <laughs> I thought that was Spike's role. Oh no. Uh, well, Spike's gonna get jealous. <laughs> But anyway, yes, it's always fun to see Tiberius again. You have to have read the Princess Luna Micro to get his full introduction, but he's always been a welcome part. And of course, Eddie Price will never miss an opportunity to include him. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Now, but if we fast forward to uh, to this party in Manhattan, which, by the way, I really enjoy uh, the Rocket Philly Center uh, skating rink at the bottom of a page. Price is peppering this with all these great references. But once again, we go to the fashion world, and I got to ask, why does Rarity want to be a part of this? 99% of the ponies at this event are just awful. Why does she want to be involved with such ponies? I do not know. Well, I cannot comprehend. Well, Silva, we- they say that... Uh, how do I put this? Uh, so, mm, it, it's going to be sounding mean if I say it, but... Uh, I, I don't know. How, how how do I put this? Certain cliques of people do stick together. 
um, like the reviewers, the musicians, the artists and whatnot, they tend to stick together because, well, it's our clique. Then somehow they created a club that rifts people apart. I'm going to speak from personal experience. That's a really stupid thing to do. Sticking to just reviewers or just fashion designers or so on and so forth, that is a surefire way to sabotage yourself. Eh, some people tend to like it. I don't know. Seppi seems to be in the club, if you know what I mean. Well, my advice to any who are listening is oh, oh, reach out beyond your immediate click or group and get some outside perspective. You'll you will need it. Now, here's the thing. Rarity is a fashion designer, and she she at least finds a kindred spirit in chiffon ruffles. But the other ponies are just the antithesis of her personality, her perspective, her friendliness. Because Rarity has made friends outside of this clique. And has made her a better, apparently a more well-adjusted individual than a lot of the other ponies we see. So I'm not sorry to see her get away from that. In fact, I genuinely think it was a waste of her time, energy, and attention. She could have met Chiffon Ruffles in a, a dozen other more positive ways. Oh, true that, true that. I, I do hope that we get to see Chiffon Ruff, uh, Ruffles uh, later on, because she seems like a cool character to expand on. And meanwhile, Spike is getting disrespected by everybody. The guards think he's the hired help. The uh, As soon as, uh, was it Fleur Delay sees him and realizes he's not a designer or a client or a buyer, he's not worth knowing. He's getting dissed every which way. Yeah, we just need to wait for Spike to grow a little bit older, and then, yeah, he's, he's going to get all the respect. Actually, Flair Dulles kind of reminds me of those kinds of people where, uh, unless you're famous or something like that, they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, honestly, isn't Fleur's attitude a bit more friendly? I don't see it. <laughs> it's a bit more opportunistic. All right, probably uh, fan fiction then. All right, yeah, no problem. So, anywho, uh, we're almost to the stretch end, so I'm just going to continue on. So, anywho, um, they board the train, and Spike complains to Rarity for a bit because all he wanted was just to have a great time with Rarity, tagging along to wherever she wants to go, and the only thing that he asks from Rarity is that they get home on time for the fireworks. That's the only thing that he asks. But he just says, like, okay, um, I'm getting this left, right, and whatever because people don't like me. Just, yeah, whatever it is, whatever it is. But he's at his boiling point. And then suddenly, wham, an avalanche. Oh, no, it hits the train, and the train is derailed, and, well, not good things happen. So they carve out or dig out a road for the other passengers to head out from the train and it seems that Rarity is guilty for treating Spike badly and says she's sorry and with all of her might uh, she will carry Spike home to Ponyville to see the fireworks while Rarity is carrying Spike along. Uh, it seems the rescue brigade are here. Uh, Princess Twilight and Ra Rainbow Dash and also some of the uh, bad ponies. And also, I got no idea, rescue ponies? They're, they're new, they're new. So anywho, they are there to rescue the stranded ponies from the train. And, oh no, the fireworks happen and... Spike didn't get a chance to see them in Ponyville. And Rarity is sorry about it and she feels bad. I'm going to pause here. So, Silver, what do you think? Well, first off, you're making me think of a song. Rescue ponies, roll to the rescue. Ponies in need, heroes indeed. Where's that from? Oh, my God. All right. Uh, wow. This is You can't even claim that you're uh, too young to know this. This is... Rescue Bots, a Transformers spinoff. Oh, that That's one. Been oh, going on. I, I can't believe this. Well, I don't I'm, watch hey, it. I've seen it from time to time. I just oh, no, barely no, no, hear no, the no, intro. No. I mean, my singing is awful. I fully admit that. But come on. <laughs> come on. What the heck? 
But, okay, let's start with the most terrifying aspect of this. This sunset shimmer, uh, no, no, starlight glimmer nutcracker. <laughs> it's just as the fireworks are, uh, have concluded or, you know, are getting there. And she's just standing there gritty and is like, ah! <laughs> what is this thing? What is this terror before me? Yeah, that's just creepy, yo. Forget the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. It's just the ghost of Christmas. What the hey? Yeah, this is just even creepier than the Zenyatta Christmas skin. Ugh. Nutcrackers have always been just a little unnerving because of those teeth. Mm-hmm. But going back a little further, I love that the that the uh, train is caught in an avalanche in Piro Pass. Thankfully, no one was murdered. <laughs> she I know what's that. Uh, Piro, Murder on the Orient Express. Uh. He is the main character, uh, the detective who, who does this investigation. And he is uh, a very, very famous uh, fictional investigator. Not quite on Sherlock Holmes level, but just as insightful in my eyes. Maybe more so. Here's the thing. The conflict between Spike and Rarity. He wants time with her. She's got all these commitments. While I understand that this is kind of revisiting the lesson from Suited for Success, that if you try to please everyone, you'll please no one, especially yourself. But at the same time, Rarity is doing this as an adult with a career. And there are a lot of people at the holidays who do go between uh, multiple commitments to raise money for charity, to assist others in their careers. They don't get to spend a lot of quality time, which is unfortunate, but it's a different kind of quality. And so part of me would like if Spike realized that he's being a little selfish, wanting Rarity all to himself, when she has a lot of commitments to the larger world. So I, I feel like this is sort of a one-sided moral. Hmm. I, hmm. I see what you mean, but at the same time, too, I don't feel it that way because at the very beginning, I, I know I have been very summarizing on the story for this one, so it's a bit all over the place, but <coughs> at the very beginning... Rarity double book on an event where she just could have been at Ponyville, but she promised she'd be at two places at once or two events at the same day, so she has to manage her time. And well, Spike is just there tagging along because, well, A, she wants to be spending time with Rarity, and B, he is also her timekeeper and whatnot. And yeah, it's poor experience for both of them, especially Spike here. Once the cheese fondue, couldn't get it. Uh, Once some candy cane, couldn't get it. Then uh, the final thing is fireworks. Want to see them, but well, couldn't get it. So poor timing on him. Well, not poor timing. I mean, it's not like he he didn't plan any of this, but that's part of the thing. He's coming into a a situation where he's just like, oh, I'll come along. It's like you put yourself into that flow of events. You really don't get to dictate what happens. You got to go with the flow, man. You just got to slide into it. <laughs> true, true. But also, Rarity is also the one responsible for the timing thing. Well, that's unfortunate. But then, again, you just got to adapt. Yeah, I guess, I guess. You got to adapt. Right now, Spike is too fixated on what is not happening, not what is. Yeah. So, Rarity, you and I are snowed in together, eh? <laughs> so, anywho, Tara, what do you do? What, what about you? Well, I do like how, like, pretty much with Silver Dress, the conflict between Rarity and Spike, like, how Rarity's like, um, you know, if we have a spell, if we go to a spell shop, we get transport and whatnot, and then Spike, you know, he's like, I want to be my way, and Rarity's like, fine, if that's what you want, I suppose it's all right. He's like, oh, she's going to do the blame game and try to make Spike feel bad. And then he kind of does. But after he goes off saying what he wanted, it's like, okay, Spike, this ain't really about you. But then after, you know, they make up for, this, you know, apologizing, the usual stick. And then, you know, that one part where Rarity's um, apologizing and saying, you know, my dear friend is like, oh, there's a deer right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's Hail King Aspen. It's nice of you to not be attacking Cantalot this time. <laughs> Yay. I thought they were going a bit SpongeBob for a second, where uh, Spike's like looking up the sky. He's like, "Well, that's unexpected," and you see, "Ho, ho!" It's like, "Oh, what is that?" Santa all of a sudden, it's just 
it's uh, Rainbow Dash or Twilight. I can't really tell who the speech bubbles point to, but it's like, holy snow. <laughs> it's like, okay, so it's not Santa. You just had to say, make them say, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Actually, it sounds like she, they're disparaging towards someone. <laughs> oh, boy. But uh, I do like how Rarity makes up for them and even how she even offered Spike a ride. Yay, much fun. Anywho, I'm going to wrap it up. So, well, even though Spike missed the fireworks, uh, they still have one last thing to do, and that is a sleepover at Applejack's. So they all ride on the rescue sleigh and head off to safety. Yay. So everybody is at Applejack's house, um, kind of covered in blanket because they're cold. And yeah, Rarity learns her lesson and, well, she appreciates the help or company that she has now. Yay. And comic ends. So, do you want to summarize or do you want to f- final thoughts here, or should we carry on to the second one? Well, let's give our final thoughts on this particular story because the next one I think might actually generate more discussion. All right, then. So, uh, Silver, what do you think? All right, well, well first and foremost, get Pinky out of the Melto 3000. <laughs> She's falling asleep with her face submerged in cheese. <laughs> oh, my. I mean, I know that's predicting her future and family, but at the same time, <laughs> she's not going to have that future if she drowns. <laughs> oh, boys. But th- this is a fun story. It, it features several locales. It features a lot of great references. The central conflict, I feel like it can be one-sided. It is a good uh, reinforcement of the moral, don't try to please everyone. Otherwise, you'll you'll just make everyone unhappy, and including yourself. But at the same time, I feel like there's an undercurrent of Spike's role in this that could be finessed, that maybe he can learn another lesson. And so, you know, it's it'd be fine if they both apologized. But and also, I just love the little things thrown in. I mean, the very last page has all these holiday wishes from uh from the ponies to the reader, basically. Although. I guess it's kind of funny. They're not technically allowed to say Christmas because it doesn't exist in their universe. Oh, yeah. Not, not since G1. But I, find, I guess I find it kind of funny. I keep thinking of uh, Jeff Dunham. Screw you. It's Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boys. All right. Yep, that's all I got. All right. And Tara, how about you? Well, are we summarizing the page or the whole comic? Uh, this segment of the comic. Final thoughts. My th- final thoughts, like I said, at the beginning I kind of enjoyed it, but then later on it's like, you know, the usual schlick, like I said, with, uh, you know, the holidays are about spending time with the people you love instead of actually making plans with other people's, or at least, like, um, that one Pinkie Pie, so I think it's called Too Many Pies, something like that, where Pinkie is the mirror pool, oh. where you have to make plans with at least one person and not try to squeeze everything in one day, and that's pretty much what Rarity tried doing. Except, you know, thankfully she didn't create a bunch of Rarity clones. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed the lesson and I like how it ended on a good note where everyone is sick and Rarity's like, oh, I'll, I'll stick around and help everyone feel better. Yay. That's about it? Yeah, that's it. All right. And as for me, the first part of the comic was pretty interesting. It reminded me of all those uh, Christmas sitcoms or those Christmas shenanigan movies and whatnot. And, yeah, the... the, the story here I uh, I have to agree with Silver because it's, it's <laughs> how do I put this Spike here I won't say that he's a brat but Spike and Rarity here are at fault and it seems that I don't know they, they don't really know how to time manage so it feels strange just reading something I don't know I mean it fell off it just fell off and yeah, uh, Fluttershy is with Applejack for a bit, attending uh, to her. Uh, Pinky was at the party and whatnot. And yeah, it, it was just okay. It wasn't great. Like the first part wasn't great. Great art, by the way, but it was just okay. Uh, I, I, I don't even know how to put it adequately. Ah, <laughs> uh, boys. But anywho, let's move on to the second part. 
So, second part is uh, Crumple Horn, was it? Yes. Uh, crumple Hoof, I believe it was. Or was it Crumple Horn? Which oh, one? no, it was. Yeah. I, my bad, I'm getting things mixed up. <laughs> Alright, Crumple Horn, uh, done by Trish Foster, was it? Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, Pixel Kitties. So, this is a different kind of art style. Um, this is her first work, right, in the comics? No, she well, she's done co- uh, covers before at the very least. Yeah, but in like proper comics, this is her first. Memory is failing me. I get the sense that she did. I I feel like saying she did one before. Hmm. All right, but I, I feel like this is her first. But anywho, going to move on. This scene starts at Twilight School, and I have to say, the school looks great. The school here looks great. The art here is awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've. Can't say more. Uh, looks different from the show, though. A bit. But anywho, uh, it seems that the students six are kind of messing around. They're joking around too much. And Twilight is, well, kind of not having any of this and stuff. And Pinky, best, and Pinky just reminds them that, hey, uh, if you guys don't act right or don't behave, the crumple horn will come and get ya. And Silverstream just asks, who? And Pinkie Pie just, re- well, just explains who the crumple horn is. Long story short, he is a mythical creature with horns, beards, and whatnot that kind of hurt, kind of plays tricks on you and stuff, and make sure you do the right thing. Gallus and Smolder laughs at the idea, and yeah, nah, they're not buying it. They're not buying it. So as time goes on, uh, Smolder and Gallus, being the well bad boys and girls, um, throw snowballs at ponies, and well, they're having a good time until Sm- Gallus saw a creature describing. Similar to what Pinkie Pie just explains. And I'm going to stop there. So, Silver, what do you think, man? Well, going with the art first, especially that shot of the opening shot of the school, for a minute there, I thought this was uh, Tony... Oh, dear, I'm always terrible Tony at Fleece? pronouncing his name. Oh, Kususko. Kusu- yes, uh, pencils. Hmm. Uh, it's very detailed, with lots of fine lines. And so for a minute there, I, I had to double-check our the artist. So it's always sort of, it's interesting to see how many uh, some artists have uh, digital works, some have highly detailed hand drawn, some go for more simplified views. I don't mind when the art doesn't look like the show exactly because I want to see the artist style, and it's fun to remember that these characters can be represented in a variety of styles. Yes, even pony life. Hmm. Uh. But I also appreciate that uh, that Pixel Kitties throws in some humor because if you read the title of the books on Pinky's head when she sticks it, her she sticks out from the library shelf. Uh, oh yeah, I saw that pie throwing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and the art of the joke. Always appreciate a little Easter egg. It is unusual to see the students so irreverent. They usually are much better at. Uh, paying attention but but it's also good to see the students in well they're young and a little and rowdy and it's honestly it might actually do some good for the school of friendship to show the teachers having to deal with an undisciplined cl- class i also appreciate that it looks like yona is using sandbar to create some sort of fashion <laughs> which again hints at the future Ooh, la la. yay I'll come back to the crumple horn as uh, more of the more is revealed. All right then, and uh, Tara, what about you? Well, I mean, I also love the way the art style looks. I mean, I I usually get impressed though, but this one, the way the school looks, is just like wow. Like it's because it's such a huge picture. It's like you have to draw every single thing in so detailed. It's really just wow. <laughs> But I also, like, every time I go through these comics, so even the show, I always look in the background or I find something to, you know, maybe they hit a little joke, which is what Silver pointed out with Pinky and the books. Like, I saw Pi throwing, I'm like, ah, I get it. I see the little Pi symbol right there. 
I, I got that reference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Captain America. But and I also like too how they like I didn't honestly think they'd bring up the this um certain mythology or whatnot, which I know so we'll probably go into details later on. But yeah, I just can't, I can't believe they brought that into a show slash comic that was made for little kids. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. Okay, I'm going to carry on then. So the Student 6 kind of creates a bit of hoopla by making some noise because, well, uh, they're in study hall and they make noise and stuff. So... Uh, who else? Uh, who here? I, I think one of the pies got joke and stuff because it explode and pied everyone in the face, and it covered Yona in pie. Oh no! So they try to meet up with Ocellus, but Ocellus is missing, and it seems that she might be kidnapped by the Crumple Horn. Oh no, oh no, because there's some writings on the wall saying enjoy hearts forming without me. Oh no, she's gone, she's been taken away. And soon, all the students behave and be good little students. Oh no, they've been brainwashed. So, once the students are gone, the teachers, uh, well, let's see, Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie, and also Twilight, and also Rainbow Dash, are talking about it and asking if the plan worked. And it seems that it works. And before I reveal the villain, I'm going to ask Tara, what do you think? Well, okay, I... I'm going to f- f- fast, uh, sorry, we'll wind back for, for a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the um, Gallus sees the shadow of the creature, um, at first I'm thinking, wait, is that? No, it can't be. But, you know, not going to go too far because I don't think we're that far ahead. I do like how they're causing all this trouble and the um, when the pie comes out, it's a Wendigo with a small pie. Like, you know, just pies galore. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then when Ocellus is missing, thankfully it's not Jam, because that would have been a totally creepy thing if uh, what it was written on the wall, enjoy hearth swarming th- without me. Thankfully it's not all in red. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think um, I don't have much to say for the rest, because, you know, it's the usual. All right, do that. And Silver? Well, I really feel the need to emphasize that that is mud, because I, while I understand red would be a rather terrifying color to see paint on the wall, brown is... <laughs> and play some pretty awful stuff too. <laughs> well, see, I was going to say that, but, you know, I d- didn't really think it was necessary. I do, because it's the. That's sh- not a word! <laughs> <laughs> That's nasty. Oh, God, no, 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 no. Oh, come on. What, what do you want to say? This was a South Park crossover with Mr. Hanky. Oh, God. Oh, no. no. No, Silver. No, it's Christmas. Please, no. <laughs> Your, your, your holidays are not immune from my corruption. <laughs> We're never safe from your corruption. No. No, no, no. But, okay. Let, let us talk about the mythology, because the Crumple Horn is their version of the Krampus. Although, it sounds like Pinky improv this at the last minute. Really? Yeah. That's the way uh, P- Pinky seems to have invented this on the spot. That or perhaps this is something her her family invented. I don't know. But really, this is the first and only time it's been mentioned. But here's the thing. While I highlight the Krampus because it's the most popular, the the truth is that St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, has a counter figure in many cultures. And all of them are usually very dark and tragic. The Krampus is a, a demon, a devil who accompanies him on Christmas. And while Santa would give presents to the good children, the Krampus would either give bad children a thrashing or take them basically to hell. You know, whisk them off. And that's what they're playing on here. And it's always kind of fascinating because why would you create this figure? Well, it's always to... We create dark figures, monsters, as a reflection of our own psyche. And in this case, it's a way of teaching kids uh, 
discipline, or at least that there's consequence to actions. It'd be great if you could sit a kid down and talk through them and show why an act of kindness is better and that there are emotional consequences, but good luck getting them to sit still and pay attention long enough. Now, I think sometimes to work with a child's perception, you have to distill it into an image, and often a monster can convey that image very well. Uh, I recently learned that in Japan, uh, a priest, I don't think Shinto, but I might be, I'm, I don't know enough about the terminology, but a, a, a priest of a order comes by and he, he gives little treats to kids if, they've, if the parents say they've been behaving well this year. If, however, the parents say this child has been misbehaving, the priest will, will give the kid a shake and threaten to drag them to hell. Oh, God. Which breaks them probably really hard at parties. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I, I bet he's a hoot. And speaking from personal experience, there was a, a Christmas tree ornament my family had that we were all very confused by. I don't even know where, where we got it or how. It shows Santa Claus stuffing a child into his uh, Christmas bag. He is, in essence, abducting the child. And there's no context to know if he if this child is misbehaved or is naughty. But I, I looked at that and I was like, that's not what Santa does. Or it could be his. But that's not how a parent <laughs> should behave. <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, the guy flies around once a year. I mean, you know. Flies around once a year and only visits the kid on a weekend? <laughs> Is that part of the settlement? Does he pay alimony? Uh, I don't know. You gotta tell the elves. I mean, they were in free, we're, oh. taking the, we're taking this in very dark places. <laughs> Thank you very much. Indeed. And talking about dark places, I'm going to wrap it up because there's a shadowy figure standing right behind Rainbow Dash. And, hey, it's a Discord. It's a him, a Discord. So Discord says, uh, ha it worked. And Fluttershy thanks Discord because he helped them scare the kids straight. <laughs> uh, get it? Straight? Yeah. So, anyway, um, Discord kind of likes the idea because it's uh, making mischief and, like, panic. So he's all in it. And yeah, um, it seems that their plan worked to scare the children to behave and whatnot. And yay, um, well, I guess it works and the faculty gets to rest and episode or comic ends. Silver, what do you think? Well, there's some positive and negatives here. First and foremost, it's a positive for Discord. He's had a long history of, of, of bad act decisions and actions where... where He's he becomes the antagonist. In this case, he is he is still the antagonist, but he's doing it with the purpose of outdoing the student's own antagonism. Ergo, this is actually the perfect role for him. If the ponies adapted this his role rather than try to force him into a into a pattern of behavior, then I think they'd have a much easier time with him. So this is a, a great positive for Discord. It's a lousy presentation for the main six as teachers, however. Up until now, out pranking them. I think that's fight fire with fire. Sometimes you 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 break your own values to defend them. That's a very common theme. But once they ha imply that Ocellus has been kidnapped and is going to spend the whole holiday uh, in forced labor, <laughs> have fun on vacation, kids. Merry Christmas. Humbug indeed. <laughs> I feel like that is where it crosses a line. And now suddenly, just because you you just because the other party is acting wrong doesn't mean that all your actions are immediately justified. I fear that this is where the moral backing for the student for the teachers disappears. And so that it ends this comic on something of a nasty note. A bit mean spirited. Even the, even the implication that maybe something else, maybe there was a crumple horn, doing pranks in addition to Discord. Uh, I'm just like that doesn't matter so much as the blatant abuse that the stu that the main six inflicted upon their students. What the hey? This is the cynicism that I often critique. 
But it feels like it worked in this one. I, I do agree. I do agree. It felt, uh, well, c- cynical. But I, I don't know. It how how do you even put this? Like I I agree with you, man. Like it's not in the holiday spirit, but it's kind of funny. I'd be lying if I if I said I didn't find the expressions on the student six. Uh, well, remaining student six, funny in their last panel. At the same time, I can't wait to see their therapy bill. <laughs> oh, you mean with Starlight? Well, she. I think we established this season that she sucks at that job. So maybe they need to see counseling outside back home. Oh, you, you and I will be engaged in smash therapy. <laughs> uh, Silverstream will need to talk it out with her brother. Sandbar's got his family. I feel bad for Smolder and Gallus. We both know emotional health won't isn't a priority where they come well, from. Well, they, they can always go to Trixie. Okay, and we want them to feel better, not what? <laughs> Whatever Trixie does, that can only be worse. Yep. <laughs> you must take that pain and transform it into drama <laughs> for your next performance. Boys. <laughs> oh, but anyway, is that all you said? That'll do it. All right. And Tere, what about you? Well, I also have, like, mixed opinions on this, but I, I actually agree with Silver because, like, Yona, Osalis, and Silverstream didn't do anything wrong. Or Sandbar. It's just Gallus and Smolder, but the, they all pay the price for their actions because uh, even, like, the whole Krampus thing, it, it picks, uh, I wouldn't say he picks on, but, you know, it goes for the bad boys and girls. But it's just Gallus and Smolder that are doing bad. Why are they all paying for the price of their actions? That's just, like... Bad on their part, <laughs> but and again, it surprises me too how they bring that kind of mythology into a comic for usually you know for kids with colorful ponies, and then this comes along. It's like that's going on a dark term. <laughs> but and as I was going through, and like I said in the beginning, with uh, when Gallus saw that shadowy figure, and I I'm thinking, is that no? Nah, I can't be. And I mean, you know, it's a thing for kids, so it it was bound to be Discord. But at the same time, I was kind of open, like, you know, maybe it could have been another different creature, but he was in on the joke, and they called him from, like, another place. But, you know, a guy can hope. Huh. But, like, again, I didn't hate it. I, I just, just find it decent. Alrighty, then. Um, as for me, this comic was okay. I like the art. But the whole Christmas or the holiday spirit for this one is just not there. Y- it's a bit mean spirited if you ask me. And if you were to say things like, okay, what about in season eight where Gallus sabotaged the heart swarming tree or something like that? What did he do again? Just peppered some powder onto the crystal heart or something like that and made it explode glue, glue or gunk or whatever it is. Well, not the crystal heart, but the fl- the the flaming heart. Yeah, so he did that. I mean, but that one was just because he didn't want to be alone on the holidays and whatnot. And yeah, this one just seems a bit too mean. But in the end, Discord did a great job. Um, he is working with the main six. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's just okay. It's just okay. Uh, and with that, the comic ends, and we are left with, well, let's just say a very okay Christmas special. And with that, uh, well, it ends, it ends. Silver, what are we going to do for, well, I'm guessing the New Year? Well, we, we've still got some parts of Season 9 to work through, including a trivial pursuit. Ah, Get your hand buzzers ready. All right, yeah, all right, yeah. And that will be, well, recording shenanigans are abound, but yeah, this is what we're going to record next. Uh, when it comes out, I got no idea because there's a lot of things in between. I got no idea. Recording for the holidays. <laughs> uh, recording for the holidays is just strange. But anywho, if you guys have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at mgmail.com. You can also reach us on the Twitter. The show's Twitter account is at MBS Show. And my personal Twitter account is at Roman Sanzo. Uh, Silver, where can the good people find you? 
Well, you can find me on Twitter and DeviantArt under MLP Silver Quill. You can also find me on Patreon and Kofi, uh, which that helps uh, helps with my comics, with posting editorials, with making video reviews, all manner of good things. And if you go to YouTube and do a search for After the Fact or Silver Quill, I shall appear. Plus, catch me on Equestria Daily on Wednesdays, writing comic reviews and editorials. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Tara, what about you? Well, the good people could easily find me on Facebook, DeviantArt, Twitter, or YouTube under the name Tortero1324. Or they could just do a simple Google search, and I'll be on all those platforms, including my Patreon page. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And also, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes, YouTube. Don't forget to press the bell icon to stay up to date. And switch your radio, and also like our Facebook page. You can also get us on live.com. Links are in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash show. With every support, you get a week's early access to the review and discussion podcast, exclusive and deleted content. And a huge thank you from me. Talking about the thank yous, I would like to thank Amy, Lucky Knight, Jeffrey, Myself Leg, and also Tristan. Thank you so much, guys. You guys are great. So anyway, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am Cecil Vequil. And I am Torterra. And we'll guys catch you next week with another fun episode of the BS Show. See ya. Merry Christmas. And happy hearth swarming. So what do you guys got me for Christmas? Uh, I didn't open my present yet. Oh. Yes, it's the day before Christmas. What kind of impatient guy are you? I know, Norman. What's wrong with you? I live in the future. I'm a day ahead. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, then, right now we got diddly squat. Oh, no. Oh, no.